just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as Good evening. Uh, let's pray. Our God and our Father, help us tonight as we open your word. Uh, may it be a blessing to each heart. Uh, may the Lord Jesus have the preeminence in all things. In his name, amen. Uh, last week, we looked at the Lord Jesus as the judge, the judge of the living and the judge of the dead. And we saw that he is uh, worthy to be judged because he is the eternal son of God and perfectly omniscient and knows all things and knows the workings of the hearts of men. And he is the son of man. God became a man. He has uh, lived in this world. He uh, was perfect in all his ways. Uh, he was sinless. He never sinned. He's the author and finisher of faith, always trusted in God. So with all the opposition that men and women uh, endure in this world, face in this world, he was victorious, and therefore he is able to be the judge of all men as a man. So sitting upon the great white throne judgment, the judgment of the dead, will be the Lord Je Jesus. He will be that great judge, and he's the judge of the living when he comes and does battle, as we read in Revelation 19, to establish God's kingdom. Uh, but this week, I would like to talk an, about another kind of judgment. And that's a judgment that we're all familiar with. It takes place uh, every day in our lives. It's the judgment of conscience. So God has placed within each one of us a knowledge of good and evil. It's, it's a courtroom, really, uh, that uh, uh, we hear uh, the, the judge's gavel come down and declares that we're guilty because we've all have sinned. We know it's right to do, but we haven't done it. In Proverbs 20 and 27, I'll just read it. It says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. So the spirit of man, the higher part of the man is where the conscience is. And, and uh, uh, it's a courtroom, uh, discerns good and evil. So you remember with Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, they only knew good until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, they only knew God and what God had created and everything he created was good. Uh, but now they knew evil. And where did they discover evil? Within themselves. 
And God said that uh, man has become like one of us, uh, knowing good and evil. And what was the evidence that uh, this conscience now was condemning them? This courtroom uh, within Adam and Eve was condemning them? Well, they ran and hid from God. Uh, they had an internal testimony, their conscience, that they were wrong. And all of us have that internal testimony. So in the book of Romans, the second chapter, God tells us about the working of the conscience. And in verse 15 of chapter 2 of Romans, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, the, their conscience also bearing witness, their thoughts accusing or else excusing one another. So uh, the conscience is God's courtroom within us. And thank God for that that we have that knowledge of, of good and we have the knowledge of evil. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have a guilty conscience. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we might have a guilty conscience because we're guilty. And so uh, God has given us that conscience that we might turn to Christ and uh, that we might uh, have forgiveness. And if someone uh, tonight has never turned to Christ and your conscience is witnessing to you that you've sinned and that you're far from God, you need to turn to God tonight, and you can. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is just a prayer away. You can trust him as your Lord and Savior and be forgiven. Praise his name. So because God has given us a conscience, we are to judge ourselves. We're to use self-judgment. And man is able to judge himself. We know that because in Romans 2, it tells us that man uh, judges and condemns others. Well, that's a true evidence that we're able to make righteous judgments because uh, even though we excuse our own behavior, we often condemn the behavior of others. And uh, that's an evidence that we are able to, that we have a conscience and we're able to make judgments. And uh, uh, unfortunately, those judgments are often against other people instead of recognizing our own guilt. But in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, and in verse um, 28, God deals with this whole issue of self-judgment. And he says this, uh, but let a man examine himself. So I'm just taking this out of context. The context is the Lord's Supper. But he says, let a man examine himself. So that's self-examination. That's self-judgment. And in verse 31, he goes on and says, but if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. What does that mean? Well, if we would use self-judgment, uh, uh, then the Lord wouldn't have to discipline us. Uh, it, we would uh, uh, recognize our own sin and repent of it. And that's certainly what we should do. So we each have this conscience. And, and uh, yet, for a believer, uh, it can be quite confusing. Um, and I want to explain what I mean by that. Not confusing that the conscience isn't clear. Uh, you know, our conscience has uh, been shaped by the Word of God. Every believer, uh, their conscience, their knowledge of what's right and what's wrong has been shaped by the Word of God. Uh, the enemy wants to distort the conscience of men and, of course, been successful in that. And many call good evil and evil good. Uh, but uh, for a believer, his conscience, our conscience has been shaped by the Word of God. But I want to talk about a Christian, a believer, and, and what can be confusing as far as our own guiltiness when our conscience, uh, you know, condemns us. Uh, first off, we know that uh, uh, our conscience works and, and should work as from God to let us know about sin. We've already mentioned that. And, and uh, David, you remember, two on two occasions, uh, David, it says his heart, his heart smote him. One after he cut uh, off Saul's uh, uh, skirt when he was in the cave. And it says his heart smote him. In other words, his conscience uh, condemned him for having raised his hand against uh, the anointed of the Lord. And that's in 1 Samuel 24, 5. And then again in 2 Samuel 24, 10, his heart smote him again after he had numbered the, uh, the people. Uh, when he was, you know, trying to find out how much, how big of an army he had or could get together. So on both of these occasions, his conscience was working. After he had done wrong, his conscience told him, you've done wrong. And we all have experienced that. And what are we to do at that moment? Uh, we're to do what David did. Uh, we're to confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
our conscience. The gavel's gone down. We're guilty. We've sinned. And we're to confess that. But what I was saying earlier about Christians, you know, sometimes confused. See, a Christian is the only person uh, that has two natures. So we are partakers of divine, partakers of the divine nature. And we have still uh, that old Adamic nature, which is called indwelling sin or the flesh living within us. And I, I, I just wanted to, to uh, speak about this. You know, Romans 7 really brings out a struggle that the Apostle Paul was having in relation to feeling self-condemned uh, when, you know, perhaps he shouldn't have. And what I mean by that is the Bible tells us in 1 John 3, that uh, a believer cannot sin. What? Well, what he says is, is that the new nature, the divine nature within us cannot sin. So I'll just read that in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Well, what does that mean? It's talking about the divine nature. The divine nature can't sin. So in that sense, a believer can't sin. His real nature is divine nature, being born again. God gives us a new nature. Uh, the old nature is corrupt. And so part of the great salvation is this new birth. We get a new nature. But the old nature, the flesh or indwelling sin remains. That is the source of all sin, always has been, even before you're saved, or, or before you're saved, of course, and even after you're saved. So uh, this is important to understand. And, and I, I just want to refer to a scripture in James regarding this. So in James chapter 1 and verse 14, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, what is it saying? It says just what we're talking about, that the flesh within us, within the believer, is the source of all sin. He's drawn away of his own lust. Well, there's no lust in the divine nature, so lust uh, rests within the flesh. Now, listen, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, the flesh indwelling sin does not change. It doesn't get improved. It's just as rotten as it ever was. Doesn't matter if you've been a Christian like myself since 1978, my flesh is just as rotten as it ever was. Uh, the only difference is now I see more and more clearly how filthy and rotten it is, but it never changes. Uh, God does not improve it. It's too bad to be improved. He condemned it at the cross. When Jesus Christ, blessed uh, Savior, when he who knew no sin became sin. He became the very evil that rests within that nature. He became that before God. We see it uh, pictured in uh, John 3, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's that picture of sin, and, and he became a curse because sin uh, deserves a curse from a righteous God. So praise the Lord, the blessed Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. He he became that evil that we are, and it was condemned at the cross. And then, as we read in Romans 6, or see the picture of it, and, and, and the teaching also, that the we died when Christ died. So when Christ was judged upon the cross, then we died there. That old sinner we used to be is dead. That's what baptism pictures. You're burying the old man. So he's gone. Okay, but he's left some of his baggage uh, behind the flesh, you know, the sin, the, the indwelling sin. So it's significant to understand that the indwelling sin, the flesh, is the source of all um, evil. So it's important to note that that indwelling sin is the source of all temptation to do evil within the believer. That never changes. And uh, so uh, the believer has this battle going on within him. He has this new nature that does not sin, cannot sin, loves God. And he has this uh, old uh, uh, nature that is foul and filthy that doesn't change. That nature, again, is the source of every sin. 
Every time you have an evil thought, every time you get angry, uh, or I get angry, uh, any temptation to do evil, it, it originates from that nature. So we know that the believer has, faces three enemies, the, the devil, the world, and the flesh. You know, the devil is the controller of this world and, and this world system uh, that uh, wants to draw men uh, away from God. And then the flesh within us is what responds to the uh, temptations of the devil that finds those things appealing. That's why the Lord Jesus could never sin. He had no sinful nature so that uh, there was never anything appealing uh, with about sin. Uh, he hated it. He hated sin. He hated to be tempted. And so that's why, you know, you experience this as a Christian. You know, you have this temptation from the flesh, uh, evil thought, something uh, uh, to be angry. You know, you, 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 you want to be angry and, and you catch yourself and you just groan. You go, oh, because uh, you have a divine nature and you don't want to sin against God. So it's not a sin to be tempted. But I want to say this, the greatest enemy of those three is the flesh, because it's the flesh within us that uh, approves of sin, that desires sin, uh, that uh, wants uh, to satisfy the lust with, within that evil nature by sinning. So uh, don't think that the, the devil or the world that the biggest problem is. The biggest enemy is within us. Oh, this is so hard to get a hold of and yet so true. The greatest enemy of the believer is within us. It's the flesh. It's indwelling sin. And so I, I want to look just uh, for a moment at Romans chapter 7. And the reason we're going this direction is because we're talking about uh, the, the conscience and how it works to, to condemn us when we do wrong. But I want to tell you that I think there's many times that a Christian feels condemned, just like Paul does in Romans chapter 7, feels condemned, and he shouldn't. And I just want to read the fourth verse because it really gives us uh, the instruction that, that flows from the whole chapter. And uh, the, Paul is dealing with how to be fruitful for God, how to have a victorious Christian life. And uh, this has connection with the conscience. We'll see that in a moment. But the truth here, I'm going to read in verse 4. He says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So just like Romans 6 teaches, we're dead. We died with Christ. We're dead to sin, dead to the law. What does that mean? The law is no longer the authority over a Christian. The Ten Commandments are not the authority over a Christian. Well, who's the authority? He goes on. We're dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. So in this verse is so helpful. Uh, it, uh, it gives us the truth that's taught in Romans 6, that we're dead to sin. Uh, we've died with Christ, so we're dead to sin. And now it says we're dead to the law. In other words, the authority in the Christian's life is not the law, not the Ten Commandments. It's Jesus Christ himself. So it's in our relationship with Christ, uh, the living, the resurrected living Christ, that we can have uh, fruit for God only in our relationship with him. He becomes the authority in my life. And why do I obey him? Because I love him. It's a love relationship, right? And, and that's where the uh, power of a Christian to live a godly life flows from. I love the Lord and I want to please him. So you can look at the example of a husband and wife. A husband goes out one night and and uh, comes back home, tells his wife, "Listen, you know there was a girl at this business meeting, and she came on to me, and I, I uh, but uh, I didn't, I wasn't with her because the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery." Well, what do you think? You know, the wife is going to say, "Oh, so you wanted to commit adultery, you wanted to be with her, but but the law said I you couldn't, so you didn't." Listen, what the wife wants to hear is that the husband. Uh, because he loves his wife, would not be unfaithful to her. And, and that's the same way with uh, the Lord Jesus. We don't, we're not under the Ten Commandments, so we don't steal because the Bible says thou shalt not steal. No, we don't steal because we want to please the Master, and uh, he doesn't want us to steal. So in, in pleasing the Master, in, in being under his authority, of course you keep the Ten Commandments because uh, you know that's they're a, they're a statement of what's right before God, but it, they're not the authority. The direct authority in a Christian's life is the Lord. Okay, so that's the teaching of 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 the chapter. 
So Paul's experience in this chapter, though, is that he's trying to produce fruit for God in his own life. He's trying to clean up his life. He's trying to uh, uh, make himself be a better person, a better Christian. And he keeps failing over and over and over and over again. And every time he fails, he feels more miserable because his conscience is condemning him and he knows he's wrong and he's dishonoring the Lord and he just feels miserable. And so he discovers something. And I'm going to read in Romans chapter 7, and he says this, and I'm sure everyone can relate. For that, versus verse 15, for that which I do, I understand not. For what I would, what I want to do, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. So Paul says, listen, I don't do the things I want to do. I want to please God, but I don't do it. The very things I hate, that's what I do. Some Christians live their whole lives that way, in failure, always self-condemned because they continue to fail. And we, uh, we, we all should understand this, have experienced it some way because you, you'll never know the way of victory if you just accept failure. No, God wants us to be victorious. Now, Paul goes on. I'm going to go to verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So Paul, it, it, it learns something. God reveals something to him that there is an enemy will living within him. He calls it indwelling sin, sin that dwelleth in me. See, every time he failed, he thought he was failing, and he is, but He's failing because he didn't realize there's a battle going on within him that he cannot win. You cannot defeat the flesh. You cannot defeat indwelling sin. It requires the power of the Spirit of God. I'll just read in Galatians what it says about that battle. Uh, In Galatians 5, 17, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. There's the new nature, the Spirit of God uh, empowering the new nature, and the Spirit against the flesh. So this battle is going on, and these are contrary to one another. So there's a a warfare going on within, but see, it was the Spirit of God that empowers the divine life, the new life. So uh, let's just look at it this way. You get saved, and you're born again. You got a new nature. The flesh is still there. So the Spirit of God, but you can't live for God. You can't. You want to because the new nature is within you and you want to live for God, but you can't because you can't make it happen. It requires the power of God's Spirit in order to be victorious in the Christian life. Dependence upon the Holy Spirit to change us and to empower us. And and, and we, we depend upon the Holy Spirit because we love the Lord and we know this is the way of victory. So Paul now identifies the enemy within him. Do you realize there's an enemy living within you? It's indwelling sin. And, and so when you sin or when you're tempted, it's not you. It's sin. It's indwelling sin. It's the flesh. So, and this is the part I want to bring it back to the conscience. Immediately when we are tempted to do evil from the flesh within us, regardless of how the devil through the world system is tempting us, we, are, we feel a response. We feel a sinful desire within us. And immediately we go, oh no, I've done it again. Wait a minute, you haven't done anything. You, you've just been tempted. Now, if, if we, if we uh, give in to the temptation, that's different. So I have a temptation to be angry and, and I stop myself and I go, oh no, that's the sinful nature. Uh, I, I will not listen to that. Well, that's what we should do. But if I uh, uh, am tempted to be angry and I go ahead and get angry, then I've sinned and I need to confess it as sin. So you see the difference? One is being tempted, but I'm, I'm opposing it. I'm saying, no, that is not who I am. That is the enemy within me trying to get me to be angry. I will not, I will not go that direction. I will honor the Lord. And, 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 but if I give in, then I need to confess it as wrong. So Paul, through his personal struggle, is learning that he has two natures, and he is learning this, and this is important, he's learning to identify with the new nature. It's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay, That's not to cop out. That's simply saying the truth. It's indwelling sin that's the source of all evil. 
And I want to identify myself with the new creation. I want to identify myself with the living Christ in whom I have been joined together with. I am not what I used to be. Hallelujah. So uh, uh, I hope this will be helpful because if it's not, your conscience is always going to continue every time you have some evil thought or evil desire to do something. It's not evil to be tempted. I mean, if, 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 if we... Uh, allow our conscience to condemn us every time that we're tempted, my, we're going to live in self-condemnation. That's exactly what happened to Paul in Romans 7. Listen to what he says at the end in verse uh, 24. He says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Oh, wretched man that I am. How terrible to live in self-condemnation. So there's a victory. It's identification with Christ. It's knowing that the old man has been set aside. Hallelujah. And we have a new life in Christ. So uh, I hope this is helpful. It's an it's, um, experience that every believer uh, goes through in some measure. Uh, even the Apostle Paul, that great man, he went through this experience. And he was uh, uh, learned the secret of victorious living. It's through the Spirit of God, and that's in Romans 8, but we don't have time for that. So let's look to the Lord. Our God and our Father, we thank you so that uh, you have made a way for us to be victorious as believers. Hallelujah. And thank you for our conscience within us. Uh, may we keep a good conscience, uh, not not a defiled one, not uh, uh, not listening to our conscience when, we, when we've sinned, but help us to distinguish between being tempted and, and sinning, Lord. Uh, just to help each believer, help each one of us that we could glorify thee and that we could bring forth fruit by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, fruit to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.